Speaker, it's Trevor Goring. Trevor was born and educated in London, England, and he has worked closely with the international trial lawyer community for over 20 years as an artist, speaker, author, and consultant. He started his career exhibiting in galleries and museums while teaching at the Montreal Museum School of Fine Arts. He published French language arts magazines co-founded a Canadian National Contemporary Arts Organization and directed a major public arts center for over a decade. He has served on the Eastern Canada Rhodes Scholarship Selection Committee for three consecutive years. In 1991, he founded Images of Justice, a visual exploration of the history and symbolism of law through original paintings, prints, books, and, and lectures. He has since exhibited at over 400 legal conferences in Europe and North America, lectured in Paris and across the United States, published two legal art history books, and written numerous articles for print and electronic media. His works have appeared on scores of magazine front covers and in several widely used legal textbooks. Portrait subjects include Supreme Court justices, philanthropists, elected politicians, university presidents, and numerous prominent trial lawyers. His works are to be found in hundreds of private, public, and corporate collections. Trevor currently maintains studios in Montreal, Canada, and on the banks of the River Lee in Cork City, Ireland. Please give a round of applause for Trevor. Well, hello everyone, and um, thanks for coming to listen and to see um, what an artist might possibly be able to contribute to the trial lawyer community and indeed to the art of advocacy. Now, you are all primarily highly skilled wordsmiths and rational to your very core. I am primarily an intuitive artist. But to be successful in my profession, I have to draw quite extensively upon the skills that you excel in. Um, I would say correspondingly that working with AAJ for over 20 years, I have come to believe that um, you could all greatly benefit from drawing somewhat upon the skills that artists also possess. After all, you know very well that an increasingly high percentage of the jurors who decide your cases learn through seeing and retain as little as 10% of what they are told verbally. They live in a digital world of fast-paced editing and have generally very short attention spans. So practicing the art of rhetoric and logical verbal persuasion really no longer suffices in the courtroom. And I think there's a pressing need for you to acknowledge the total lack of aesthetic training in your profession. It's reassuring to know, however, that with the right approach, almost anybody can shift their mode of perception and can start to see beyond the deceptive illusion of your day-to-day -day realities. Now, I thought that I would share with you to start off this recent painting of mine of Nelson Mandela who opened, in, in fact, the first black law firm ever in South Africa. And the reason I want to show it to you is because I've painted him with a very special pair of spectacles in his shirt pocket. These are the spectacles of another lawyer who practiced law in South Africa, Mahatma Gandhi. And these spectacles symbolize how Mandela was inspired to see things that others could not see. And I would ask you all now to please put on the very special red spectacles that are before you and let us see 
how they change our vision over the next 45 minutes. So friends, wordsmiths, trial lawyers, lend me your eyes. And let's see, together, differently. Let's lift the veil and strip the veneer of our day-to-day -day vision. And let's see our way more clearly in what is clearly a more visually complex world. It was the young Einstein who said that the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. He went on to lament that we have created a society that honours the servant and has forgotten the gift. So today let's remember that gift. Let's acknowledge the intuitive mind. And let's see how visual literacy and aesthetic thought can help us be more intuitive, better creative problem solvers, and better trial advocates for your clients. Let's explore how visual thinking can improve your powers of observation and your ability to identify critical images in your cases, and your capacity to see beyond the illusion of rational thought. Now, you all know that storytelling is central to being effective trial lawyers. Storytelling rules. It is the key to the art of persuasion. <laughs> and many of you have learned how to frame and develop the theme of your case and to build a compelling hero-centric narrative. But as a visual artist, as a painter on canvas, I do not share the luxury of a timeline in telling my story. There is no beginning, middle and end to a canvas. No chance for conventional theme and character development, flashbacks or repetition. No, the visual artist, painter, photographer or sculptor must condense a complex subject into one single image that reveals the heart and soul of the matter. We must capture the story in one penetrating gaze, intuitively selected, meticulously structured, and masterfully executed, so there can be no escaping the powerful emotional impact. Now artists tend to arrive at this viewpoint through intuitive insight and trial and error, and sometimes great paintings fall into place as though they had already existed. And at other times, have a long and protracted, painful birth. Certain principles, however, are unchanging. And today I wish to share a few thoughts and anecdotes that illustrate the issues surrounding visual thinking and introduce a few signposts along our journey, the better we hope to see what others may overlook. It's 1991, and I'm in the basement of the Toronto Hilton Hotel. I've just walked into one of the very first trial lawyer conferences that I've ever attended, and I really don't know what to expect. The guest speaker is billed as a senior trial lawyer, a past president of ATLA, an acronym that means absolutely nothing to me at the time. 
The main conference room is filled to capacity, and the moderator has made her introductions, and up has stepped the keynote speaker. No notes in sight, walking around, connecting performer and audience, the speaker launches into Shakespeare's and Cicero's powerful, persuasive language. He projects images of great paintings by David and Poussin to illustrate physical courtroom dominance, explaining the technique of anchoring positions in space, to the right when arguing damages, to the left when arguing fault. Singing quirky nursery rhymes I've never heard before, and I know a good few. He walks around with red apples and yellow lemons, explaining how women see colour differently from men due to the differing levels of optic nerves. More colour-sensitive cones in the woman's eye, more tone-sensitive rods in those of the male. He fascinates with his hilarious, penetrating analysis of rhetorical techniques, modulating his voice, loud now, then almost a whisper, gestures with arms wide open, in inclusive arms low down and pushing back, dismissive all the time. Sight and sound, eyes and ears, shaping our perception, focusing our conscious and unconscious minds on how to tell a story. In the present tense, of course, how to employ embedded commands and rules of three. How to emulate the great speakers throughout history to persuade an audience to touch their souls. From the first few words, from the first few images, I am, as we English say, gobsmacked. For here is the truly unexpected. Here is a kindred spirit. Here is an art form I never knew existed. Later, exhilarated and inspired, I reflect on this experience. I, I had gone there wanting to take a break from the esoteric contemporary Emperor's New Clothes art community that I had lived so intensely for years. And what do I find? Trial lawyers are performance artists. I'm out of the cultural flying frying pan and into trial by fire. Not what I expected, but I think it's my kind of a world. But then, slowly, attending up to 25 legal conferences a year, I realize that this was an extraordinary exception. And that the majority of attorneys I meet are totally unaware or completely dismiss the importance of creative visual thinking in their work, I realize that something is not quite rotten, but certainly not quite right in your adversarial state of Denmark. And that maybe this is in part an issue of visual literacy and creative confidence an issue of how we learn, or more often, don't learn to see. And how we balance, or most of the time, don't balance how the two main hemispheres of our brain operate. Now, you're probably all aware that, very simply put, your left brain hemisphere is your verbal and analytical rational brain. It thinks serially and reduces its thoughts to numbers, letters, and words. Your right brain hemisphere is your nonverbal and intuitive brain. It thinks in patterns or pictures composed of whole things and processes information all at once, like recognizing the face of an old friend. Now, this division is called brain laterality and has been both embraced and dismissed 
by the neuroscientific community. As with extraordinary advances in imaging technology, they increasingly discover that the differences are much more about how the two hemispheres use their skills rather than what skills they may possess. Indeed, this uneasy relationship within our brains, as played out in the history of ideas, might suggest that society in general is suffering from the consequences of an over-dominant left hemisphere, losing its natural equilibrium. Once again, this concept of having lost the gift of intuition. Now, I'd like here to engage you in a brief exercise to illustrate the point. I'm projecting images on the screen that complement my words, and in general, I let them speak for themselves. In this way, their impact is not diluted or undermined by any explanation, an important point that we will revisit a little later. Nonetheless, I would ask you now to really focus on the next three images and prepare yourselves as follows. The moment they appear on the screen, say to yourself, without hesitation, what colour do you see? Are you ready? Remember, identify the colour first. Well, it's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? And I think you'll all agree, there is definitely some kind of conflict here in how our brains are processing this information. And it's a simple but clear illustration of the relationship between the two modes of perception. How the two hemispheres of the brain function or conflict. In most cases, it's also a clear indication of which hemisphere dominates. So, hence we can say there are basically two ways of knowing and seeing. There's the creative, and there's the analytical. In truth, we're all pretty much dominated by our left brains, because this enables us to function more easily in daily life, and to make sense of and not be completely overwhelmed by the massive onslaught of stimuli constantly bombarding our senses. Most artists suffer from the same conflict of cognition when presented with the slides I just showed you. Most artists, however, are far more easily capable of overriding their left brain and entering the creative right brain zone when engaged in their work. And I should stress here that being creative or artistic doesn't necessarily mean you know how to draw or play an instrument. Being creative is a way of thinking, a way of viewing the world. And more importantly for attorneys, a way of problem solving. <laughs> this might solve a lot of problems. <laughs> So, in over 20 years of working with the trial lawyer community, I observed and listened closely. And I have to say that a disproportionate number of you are convinced that you are totally without any visual creative ability whatsoever. And I wonder about your previous experience with the visual creative process. Now, I have taught art to many children and adults and well know how easily students can be deeply discouraged by misguided teaching methods or indeed by the student's own misconceived expectations of what constitutes success in art. Building skills in maths, sciences and languages is far easier to evaluate than in the visual arts. 
And here, if you would allow me, let me tell you a little story because I found it resonates with a lot of people and it also illustrates how we can take back what once was lost. As a young child growing up in bombed out central London after the Second World War, we lived cheerfully unaware of any sense of deprivation despite strict food and fuel rationing and the limitations of a country recovering from extensive devastation. My parents, both recently demobbed from the RAF, moved house and I started to attend infant school in the borough of Marylebone. Now, the school had art classes and there was great excitement and anticipation as the colours, brushes and paper were being handed out for our first painting lesson. Most of us had never encountered any art materials before, and certainly not me. I just can't help myself. I dive right in, mixing creamy poster colours and trying them out on the irresistible white paper, totally absorbed in the explosion of colour before me. Suddenly, from above, thunder roared and a furious teacher hauls me up in front of the class. Who gave you permission to start? And what's this scribbling mess, Goring? Think you're a little Picasso, do you? <laughs> Sit out this class in the corner and let that be a lesson to you. Well, you can imagine. Ridiculed, humiliated, bewildered, you name it. I retreat into myself and for years after, dread even the thought of any kind of art class. Well, fortunately, I had two older brothers, and they were always making things at home. And they very generously included me in their activities, or even though I was probably a little brat. And, um, you know, I slowly overcame that crushing experience. And with hesitant steps, and the encouragement of wiser teachers went on to attend art school. But I've always remained acutely conscious of just how powerful that ne negative experience was and how profoundly it diminished my creative confidence at the time. Only later did I realize just how essential positive encouragement was in healing that traumatic wound. Now, if you weren't traumatized about your creative visual confidence, and I certainly hope you weren't, it most likely was simply ignored and slowly allowed to wither, usually around the age of nine or ten, as the rational, literary, numerical left brain dominance prevailed in your general education. How often have I heard the same admission? Oh, I'm barely capable of drawing a stick figure. I'm useless at art, but you know my six-year-old is amazing. You're keen to tell me how non-visual you are, as though it was some kind of guilty confession. I'm just not the creative visual type, I'm told, time and time again manifesting what often appears to be a conscious opting out from any visual creative confidence whatsoever. Oh, I can't even draw a straight line, is another common remark. Well, hey, I'm here to tell you, drawing a straight line is difficult, and stick figures in some paintings go for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, in New York galleries and even appear on the currency coins of Europe. There's no need to feel so bad. In fact, we're all more visual than we think. More than half of the neurons in our brain are processing visual stimuli. The first six months of a baby's mental development are all about vision and motion. Over 70% of the population have been shown to be visual learners. Albert Einstein 
an academic outsider who didn't start talking till he was well over two, was adamant that his thinking process was primarily visual. The ability to think and communicate in visual terms is part of and of equal importance in the learning process with that of literacy and numeracy. And our educational system, however, totally sidelines this critical field, sacrificing it on the dubious altar of the intellect. Now, Ever since, and undoubtedly even before Moses destroyed the sculpture of the golden calf, ground it into powder, strewed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink it, there has been a deep-seated hostility against graven images and profound mistrust of sensory experience. After all, a stick in water looks broken. A distant figure, much smaller than it is. A colour changes in relationship to adjoining colours. Just look at the drawings of Escher, for instance, or this illusion here, to see how deceptive vision may be. How on earth can we believe that these two red shapes be identical? But I can assure you, that they are. Nevertheless, even the first Greek psychologists, the sophists, were aware of a troubling contradiction in this scepticism of our sensory experiences. Democritus, who distinguished the dark cognition of the senses from the bright cognition of reasoning, ruefully said, O oh, wretched mind, do you who get your evidence from us, i.e. our senses, yet try to overthrow us? Our overthrow will be your downfall. So the history of thought teaches us that thinking need not be just left-brained and linear, depending upon analysis, logic, words, and numbers, thinking can also be right-brained and analogical, relying on complex images, tones, colors, and spatial relationships, the gestalt. Successful advocacy needs both kinds of thinking. And may I respectfully suggest that you just need to start observing impartially the way your six-year-old does, and blow away all those learned preconceptions and assumptions that cloud your vision and that prevent you from seeing perhaps what is rather than what you think is. Now, we used to believe that our brains, once formed in early adulthood, were incapable of change. Now, thanks to neuroscience, and especially neuroplasticity, we know that our brains remain flexible and that we can modify and refocus our mental habits and adapt our brains to changing circumstances. So my friends of a certain age, if you're looking for rejuvenation, forget the plastic surgery. Neuroplasticity is where it's at. In fact, artists and trial lawyers share much in common. And sometimes the similarities are striking and surprisingly revealing. We are equally self-employed, risk-takers, driven by a higher calling. D. 
determined, dogged, and inspired all at once. Feast or famine is the norm. And yes, you're very welcome to invite me for dinner this evening if you've just got a great verdict, along with my daughter and her boyfriend. <laughs> Then, of course, there are all those mountains of paper we use. Not to mention a weakness for living high and to the full, a firm conviction in carpe diem. I often ask my clients what moment or figure in legal history strikes a chord with them and reflects their cherished values as a litigator. It is extraordinary how often the reply is unhesitating and precise. And I'm sure it's because trial lawyers, like artists, have heroes that inspire them and core values that sustain them. For instance, Marcus Tullius Cicero accuses Verres, the corrupt given governor of Sicily, 57 BC, if I'm not mistaken. Ambrogio Lorenzetti paints the effects of corrupt government in medieval Italy. John Adams defends the British soldiers after the Boston Massacre, one of his finest moments. Francisco de Goya paints the firing squad execution of masses of Spanish countrymen by French soldiers. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson prosecutes members of the Nazi membership of the Nurem at the Nuremberg Trials. Picasso paints his iconic image of the tragedies of war, Guernica. Clarence Darrow argues against the death penalty in the Leopold Loeb trial, Chicago, 1925. Andy Warhol paints his electric chairs. These are powerful, shared manifestations of a passion for truth and justice that illustrate a lasting common bond between visual artists and trial lawyers through the ages. Now, in developing visual acuity for attorneys, I believe it's helpful to acknowledge the remarkable relationship between art and the law that exists in all cultures since earliest times. This is the great uh, mosaic in Ravello of Justinian, Emperor Justinian, and here's King Alfred, who uh, established one of the first juries in the UK. It's a subject I've been exploring and developing in my Images of Justice project for over 20 years and worthy of a whole series of lectures. But for now, let's just touch on one or two of the most archetypal images that have endured over the millennia. The ancient Egyptians knew a thing or two about the importance of iconography and made sure that they communicated their laws with the aid of powerful visual imagery. The scales of justice, that ubiquitous symbol of the law, derives specifically from the Egyptian last judgment. When, I find the, when the heart of the deceased was weighed against the feather of truth. Now, the, um, and it was weighed by the jackal-headed god Anubis here. This is Toph, who was the scribe, and he records the outcome. And if one's heart is lighter than the feather, you pass into the afterlife. And if not, you are devoured by Amit a terrifying creature, part crocodile, part lion, part hippopotamus. Now that's some potent lineup of imagery, if ever there was. Now, similarly, we have Ma'at, the Egyptian goddess of justice, the original Lady Justice, who personifies truth, equity, and ethics. 
Her symbol, the white feather, the hieroglyph of truth, always graces her headdress. And whenever you're looking at Egyptian um, imagery, when you see that white feather, that is what it's about. Now, this feather of truth can still be found today, 5,000 years later, on the other side of the globe, in the traditions and ceremonies of North American Native Indian tribes. The blindfold figure of justice only starts to appear in Europe in the late 15th century and is generally understood to represent judgment uncorrupted or impartial. In fact, however, there are considerable negative connotations of this symbolism and they can be found at the outset in such illustrations as the fool blindfolding justice by the great Albert Durer as early as 1494. It's confusing, double-edged imagery. Why? Sometimes I think that Ma'at's headband must have slipped down, or, or, or maybe Justice's eyes are banished to keep her seeing the pain caused by the sanctions imposed in the name of the law. Well, questions for another day, for there are no end of wonderful images and artworks throughout the centuries that testify to the art-law connection. And I would encourage you to seek some of these out for your own pleasure and enjoyment, and indeed, as we shall see later, to help you develop your creative thinking skills. Okay. Your wordsmith, and you feel more comfortable with words than with images. But jurors are more likely to be comfortable with images than with words. There's much teaching now in advanced trial circles. Reptiles abound about how decision-making is possibly rooted in the limbic system, the deep-seated old part of the brain where gut feelings and primitive emotions reside, and how you cannot present your cases assuming that your arguments will be received with rational analysis. Now, if you accept this theory, and it seems to generate significant results, you must understand the importance of emotional component of storytelling and increasingly accept the fact that since the unconscious mind plays such an important role in decision making, the work of trial lawyers must include impressionistic visual persuasion to complement and augment logical presentation of fact. You need to be able to pluck critical, vivid images from your client's testimony and propagate those images in the mind of the jury. Next time you take a deposition, try and be aware of the visual images that underlie what is said. A seemingly insignificant remark can trigger an image that might just pack the emotional punch you need to sway the jury. My late good friend and brilliant trial lawyer John O'Quinn from Houston always astonished me in that he still consulted Aristotle's rhetoric on a regular basis. He even bought a painting of Aristotle from me. But then the ancient Greeks knew what they were doing and so did John. They used a rhetorical figure of speech called phanopia or using a word or words to throw a visual image onto the listener's imagination. And this interplay between the verbal and the visual has to be a major contributing factor in successful trial advocacy. But remember, when presenting images verbally or otherwise, resist the urge to talk about them too much or to interpret them. They will work best when you refrain from explaining their significance, symbolism, or metaphor. Try it someday. Choose a painting you don't know and look at it closely. The more you hold out against the impulse to find narrative meaning, 
the more aware you become of the picture itself. And those pictures that provide prolonged aesthetic um, interest often do so by including the recognizable but also the unexpected, some element that disturbs our expectations. This is sometimes called poignancy or the gratuitous element and can deliver great emotional impact. Identifying such significant images in your trial can be hugely beneficial to your case. So what can you do to enhance your visual thinking and develop your creative problem-solving skills? What can you do to temporarily deactivate or override your left brain dominance and give full rein to the right brain's uninhibited potential. Now, though you probably all doubt it, with the right approach, most of you could learn to draw reasonably well within a few weeks, developing your perception of edges, space, relative angles and proportions, and light and shadow. But for the time being, a very useful and educational method developed in collaboration between the Museum of Modern Art and Harvard is a cognitive, structured approach to the study of art designed to improve observational and critical thinking skills. Here are some basic habits that can improve your daily practice of law as outlined in this visual thinking strategy. Make careful observation a habit and learn to describe what you see. Avoid preconceptions. Consider multiple right answers. Promote wonder. Embrace ambiguity. <laughs> Appreciate context. I'm sure you all know the context of this very famous photograph. Think metaphorically. And perhaps above all, recognize you, your and your clients' shared humanity. Thinking about art or aesthetic thought is rich and complex and has been conclusively shown to improve observation, speculation and reasoning on the basis of evidence. It is precisely because art is so richly complex that the possibilities of learning from it are endless. Carl Bettinger, in the introduction to his brilliant recent book, Twelve Heroes, One Voice, quotes Marcel Proux. The real voyage of discovery lies not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And although the great French writer obviously didn't mean discovery in a legal sense, his quote could not be more appropriate for how you conduct your discovery in a case. For fresh, unbiased, perception, perceptive vision serves to eliminate confusion and reveal the whole. A limited palette and simple design hones the narrative language. Oh, I can't resist backing up here. Dear old Lance Armstrong, 
You know, I mean, really, when you, when you look at the extraordinary achievements that man, you know, had. I mean, when I was on drugs, I couldn't even find my bike. <laughs> Uh, the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words, rings true still and can bring complex issues of life into sharp focus and strike resonant chords in the inner subconscious. Being all eyes as well as all ears is essential in successfully trying your cases. <coughs> So why are so many classic female figures of justice blindfolded? Could it be because sometimes images are so powerful or so poignant that they are not welcome in the court? I respectfully urge you to harness this forbidden power identifying, simplifying, and framing the poignant images of your case, and then projecting those images into the minds of your listeners. Cast your eye with confidence and clarity in your work. Be verbal painters of significant moments in your client's story. See intensely. See beyond the public face of rational thinking. Reveal the emotions that are the true source of decision-making and action. I don't know about you, but I prefer justice with her eyes wide open. Thank you for listening. Thank you for seeing, and here's looking at you. <laughs>